Good morning. Today's reading is from The Rock, St. Peter, the rock on whom the Christian church was based. I've had cataract surgery twice in the last five weeks, so my eyesight is not that good. But I will try. And for those who are going to get it, it is a piece of cake. Don't worry about it. The end of all things is upon us. So you must lead an ordered and sober life given in prayer. Above all, keep your love for one another at full strength because love cancels innumerable sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Whatever gifts each of you may have received, use it in the service of one another, like good stewards dispensing the grace of God in its various forms. Are you a speaker? Speak as if you uttered oracles of God. Are you, a, a, are you given in service? Give it in, in strength which God supplies in all things and act as if in the, the glory of God through Jesus Christ. To him belongs glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Our first lay speaker is Tim Lovkin, who has been a member of our church for about 20 years. He and his wife, Laura, have lived in Hermosa Beach since 1997. Their two adult daughters, who both now live in Portland, were raised here in this church. Tim and Laura are members of the Mariners, and Tim has served on the diaconate board. Tim works in the entertainment industry, primarily as an assistant director or second unit director. Occasionally he has other roles in the industry, including being Larry David's stunt double on the HBO hit show Curb Your Enthusiasm. During the COVID shutdown, Tim used his directorial expertise to help MBCC increase the quality of our online services and help to plan our outdoor services. I knew that the unpredictability of Tim's work schedule has limited his ability to make advanced commitments to activities and meetings. However, when I realized that the Writers Guild strike meant Tim was temporarily sidelined, I saw we had a rare opportunity to recruit him as one of our speakers. So making lemonade out of lemons, Tim graciously agreed to be here with us. So to add to that, about a month ago, I got a phone call, kind of a panicky call. Hey, I've gone through in my entire list. I can't find anybody. I understand you'll probably be unemployed. Would you want to speak? So I had time. I wrote about a 35 page dissertation. So it's all good. Oh, and by the way, Mike uh, just texted us a little while back and said, good luck, I'm praying for you. But the liter literally what he was saying was, <laughs> we're watching you. So one of my earliest memories of going to church was when I was about four or five years old. And we were still searching for a church in Albuquerque. And my parents decided to go visit a friend who was uh, a minister at a small church outside Albuquerque. So it was a Sunday morning, eight or nine o'clock in the morning. I think it was summer. I was wearing shorts. We piled into a 1950s era uh, Chevy sedan and off we went to church. About five minutes into the drive, my dad made a hard right turn and I made a hard left turn right out of the car. 
the door I was leaning against flew open and I went out into the intersection. So my dad came to a screeching halt. My mom came and gathered me up and took me back to the car. And my dad tried to stop all the bleeding. I took most of the skin off my hands and knees. And um, so he slowed the bleeding down and off we went to church. <laughs> and when we walked in, I still remember the look of horror and concern all the um, people inside the church watching me walk down the aisle with my parents. It looked like they had like, literally dragged me to church. <laughs> <laughs> so I was born in San Francisco in 1961, um, soon after my parents had moved there from Ganado, Arizona. Um, my dad uh, was helping start the cardiology program at the, at the University Hospital there. So we lived not too far from Haight-Ashbury and at that time lots of going on in San Francisco and my mom said that the beatniks were turning into hippies. So it was probably time for us to leave. So in 62 we moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the reason we ended up there is because my mom was born in back east but was raised in Tucson, Arizona and my dad uh, went to college in Tucson and they loved the Southwest, so they decided they needed to stay nearby. So um, they moved to Albuquerque, but being what they are, they didn't go straight there when we moved. They piled all of our possessions in a truck, hauling a trailer and three kids. My oldest sister was four, my brother was three, and I was one. And we took several weeks to get to Albuquerque. We went camping along the way, Yosemite, Zion, all the national parks along the way, and everything in between. So several weeks later, we piled into Albuquerque. Um, so um, my dad, when, he went, when we went there, he didn't have a job, but he was a, a, a cardiologist, so he started the first cardiology practice in Albuquerque. Soon after that, he was recruited to the in New Mexico medical um, school to be the third um, to be the third professor there. So he taught there for a while and then he went and started his practice again. We moved to a house um, that was on about a half acre of land down in the Rio Grande Valley in Albuquerque. It was a big adobe house, about 3,000 square feet. And we lived on an old windy road, which we were told was part of the Santa Fe Trail. It was a Guadalupe Trail, and it was very windy, curvy, quiet, lots of, uh, lots of eclectic homes along the way. And on the side of us was an old lane called Baita Lane, dirt road, about 20 houses on it. And we had a community pool down the street. On our piece of property was a hundred year old, um, what was it, a cottonwood tree. And um, Next to that cottonwood tree was an irrigation ditch that, that um, irrigated most of the fields around our house. A lot of alfalfa was grown. On our piece of property, we had a small farm. We had every kind of animal you can, you can imagine. We had horses, chickens, rabbits, goats, ducks, geese, guinea hens, everything else, dogs and cats. And we had a huge garden. So, Figuring that my parents needed to take care of all that, they had kids, free labor. We had lots of chores to do in the morning and in the evening. And we had to gather the eggs, feed all the animals, and weed the garden, pick all the, all the garden. We froze everything to have all winter long. So we were busy, busy, busy. But having that piece of property wasn't enough for my dad, so a few years later, he bought 40 acres up in the Manzano Mountains, and he and a friend started an apple orchard. So we had about 10 acres of apples, and over the years, he expanded that to about 300 acres of property. So if we weren't busy at, at our house, we were busy on the property, stringing fence, digging ditches, planting trees, doing all that kind of thing. But it was really, really fun. We worked hard, we played hard, we had a really great time. So you would think with all of that, we would never go anywhere. Well, that's not the truth, not the truth. 
We traveled all over the place. I figured by the time I was 10, I had been to all 11 Western states and two Canadian provinces. We went everywhere and we never stayed in a hotel. We camped and had a really, really fun time. Sometimes we would spend the whole summer gone, other times it was just a quick weekend somewhere. Exploration was, was part of our deal with our family, not just our surroundings, but also in our Christianity. Christianity was taught and practiced in our home every day. Every morning we sang hymns, read scripture, prayed before we went to school, and after we fed all the animals, of course. When we first moved to Albuquerque, my parents found a prayer group to join and started the search for a church, hence my trip out of the moving car. We eventually became official members of St. John's Church, St. John's Episcopal Church, and unofficial members of the Christian Center. We prayed with the Presbyterians, the Catholics, and the Pentecostals. We went to Billy Graham revivals, to silent retreats. We spoke in tongues. We watched a preacher lengthen someone's leg. And don't forget the Quaker meeting down the street. We even spent a day at a huge commune north of Albuquerque, which is kind of a different kind of religious experience. We rarely missed a Sunday at church. This commitment to Christianity didn't come out of nowhere, though. My dad's mom was a big part of the prayer group in Tucson that my mom attended. See, see the connection there? And two of her three sons were missionaries. Her eldest became an Episcopal priest. And on my mom's side, there were Quakers and believers and other believers in the Christian faith. Somehow, we kids found a time to play sports, soccer, field hockey, track and field, and skiing. My parents didn't really enjoy the track meets, but when my brother and I started skiing, they decided they were, we were having too much fun without them, so they learned too, in their 40s, which was good for us because we went on great ski trips all over Colorado and New Mexico. Starting in the elementary school, I got interested in photography. Both my parents were really good photographers and helped me pursue my interests. I, like so many others back then, got a brownie for my birthday or sometime, and I never looked back. By the time I got near college, I decided I wanted to be a photographer, so I applied to two schools, the University of New Mexico and Adams State University in Colorado. They had really good photography programs, and I got into both. I decided to go to Adams State, which is located in the San Luis Valley in South Central Colorado. And that's where I majored in skiing, sorry, major in art. <laughs> it was kind of like go to Adams State and get your degree, you know, ski Adams State and get your degree in your part time. So I went to school there for, for, I went four years. I was three years, I was full time. I went summer, winter, all around. Um, but and during my time off, I went and explored the San Juan Mountains and the San Luis Valley and the Sangre de Cristos. I went all over the place. And I got to meet the locals. A lot of farmers live in the San Luis Valley. That's where your, that's where, uh, your barley comes from for Coors. Um, I still keep in touch with them. I saw them just a few months ago. And after I finished four great years living in Colorado, I applied to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. And I got in, which is kind of hard to do, I guess. And I spent two years, two and a half years at Art Center and graduated there with a degree in photography. While I was in school, I got a job at an architectural um, photo studio. And when I graduated, they stuck me on an airplane and I traveled all around the country photographing for big hotel clients, Hilton and people like that, and big commercial real estate clients. But in 1987, there was a bit of a crash in the real estate market and all of our clients went the way of the dodo. We had no more clients. So I decided to jump ship and I joined uh, the circus in the film business. I started in commercials as a production assistant. So I was getting coffee and donuts and, and uh, doing whatever needed to be done on the set. And I worked my way up in, over a period of about four years to be an assistant director. Um, I worked as an assistant director for the last 30 years, but in between, I did a lot of other things. I joined 
the Directors Guild of America, which was required for what I was doing. I also joined Screen Actors Guild, and I became a Teamster. So anytime I didn't have any work as an AD, I could go off and do other things. So I was an extra in commercials and occasional movie and TV show. I was a precision slash stunt driver driving cars on commercials. And then sort of by the luck of the draw, Larry David called and I became his stunt double. Um, currently I'm working mostly as a teamster now, but uh, that's all good. Um, so anytime Larry calls, so I'm happy to go play. Um, over all those years from getting into high school, getting into college and, and for 20 some years, I never set foot in a church. Unless I was going to a wedding, a funeral, or popping my head into a rural church somewhere in the middle of nowhere to take a look around. And that was true until I met Laura. We met while she was living in Huntington Beach and I was living in Burbank next to her, one of her cousins. This cousin was trying to get us together for years and we didn't trust anything he ever said, so we basically ignored him. But we both ended up at his wedding in Wisconsin. Knowing that we were gonna be there, it was kind of a setup. But I was just gonna go with it and, you know, probably go home after that and no big deal. But a few months later, Laura and I moved together to Homerosa Beach. And a little more than six months after that, we got married. So after we got married, we started looking for churches here in, in the South Bay and we went all over the place. Uh, we actually had one church follow us home after the service and knock on the door and see if we wanted to join. The answer was no. <laughs> so we came to NBCC and we, and we liked what we saw. We liked the staff here. We liked Ray Lambert's poems. I liked John Calhoun's really long services after he came back from Bellingham because he told really good stories about his travels. And we were kind of a kindred spirit because when John traveled between Bellingham and LA and back and forth, he never went in a straight line. He always went to some little town looking for a church, hanging out on the, on the cliffs of somewhere and just enjoying his trip. The trip should take two days and it would sometimes take weeks for him to get north. And that kindred spirit is true with me because actually I just got back from Albuquerque, but it's a 12 hour drive. I drove straight out on the way out and on the way back, it took me two days because why not? I'm out there. I haven't been in the North Rim of the Grand Canyon in a long time. So I popped over there, which isn't much of a pop. It's pretty far. And, um, you know, went for hikes and enjoyed the canyon. So I'm like John Calhoun. I cannot go in a straight line. Laura likes to drive in a straight line if we go anywhere at all. <laughs> anyway, so we have two girls. Some of you know them, Emily and Kate. They're both grown. Uh, they were raised here at NBCC. Uh, we got great news the other day. Emily did graduate with her master's degree in kinesiology last well, Saturday. And um, Kate's working as a nurse in Portland and Emily is uh, moving to Portland next week. I'm moving her. She got a job at Nike in one of their labs. So there'll be roommates in Portland. It'll make it easy for us to go visit. But the kids grew up here in the church. They're both baptized here and they sang in every choir. Pat would chase us out to the car and you're singing next Sunday. And, and they were in every play. Deanne did their hair for, I don't know, a long time. Um, and um, because of that, Laura and I got more, much more involved in the church. Uh, Laura started volunteering in the production side of the plays. I was in the back doing whatever I could to help. And ultimately, Laura started volunteering for other boards. And then Rick Hefner called me one day. I guess I'm weak sometimes. And Rick, hey, Tim, you're on the deck and at board. Is that all right? Sure, no problem. So. I joined the diaconet board. Rick said it'd be fun. No, it really, it really is fun. Uh, so I joined the diaconet board and after 20 years of trying, we finally joined the Mariners. <laughs> um, 
And we've been having a lot of fun with them. We're not going to miss the baseball game next week, but we had a lot of fun with them. So, um, so because of NBCC, here I am in church again. Have a good morning. Our second lay speaker this Sunday is Monica Farrell Bringelson, the daughter of Rick and Farrell, Rick and Susie Farrell. Monica has been attending MBCC since she was three years old, starting in our Sunday school. She sang in the Carol and Youth Choir and participated in MBC's youth and adult theater productions. Monica shared with me that she chose to be married in our sanctuary in 2014 to Ningle Br to Nico Bringelson. Today she is caretaking for her spiritual home by serving on our diaconate board, participating in Soul Sisters, Women's Fellowship, and Children's Worship Arts. Monica attended Manhattan Beach's public schools. Her first job out of Miracosta was as a, at a flight school at the Torrance Airport where she learned to fly. A favorite thrilling moment in the air was co-piloting with NBC's legendary Charlie Stowe in his yellow V-tailed bonanza to buzz the coffee hour one Sunday. Monica did her underground undergraduate in fine arts and her graduate work in policy, both at SC. She worked for the business school there with her final role as director, as a director on the MB, MBA admissions committee. She then worked as director of development at the Southern California Office of Junior Achievement. She now oversees private family foundations, allowing for flexibility while she enthusiastically embraces motherhood with two young boys, Lars five and Rocco three. She continues her art career by moonlighting in the creation of mixed media art installations. And you can see her most recent and largest installation at Playa Hermosa Fish and Oyster in Hermosa Beach. Monica? Thank you for that thoughtful introduction, Wayne. Wayne is the chair of our wonderful diaconate board on which I have the pleasure of serving side by side with my mom, Susie Farrell. Aside from my mom's lullabies, one of the sweetest, most beautiful sounds to my ears, going back to about the age three. Age of three is hearing you, our congregation's beautiful, collective, booming voices all at once. And if you could please let me hear it. Good morning. So powerful, thank you. My name is Monica, and while writing this talk, I could hear, I could just hear our beloved late Reverend John Calhoun say something he told me when I, when I was feeling pressure back in high school. Monacar, Monacar, that was his fun living, loving nickname for me. He said, work and don't worry. The time you spend worrying, you could have had the work done. Easier said than done, easier said than done, John, but I loved his Johnisms. I'm attempting to reflect on approximately four decades of life with MBCC. The best overview I can give you is that the leaders and people of this interfaith and non-denominational community church gave me a rock solid foundation to always keep an open mind to always follow my heart. And when things have gone very good for our family, you've shared in our joy. And when things have been pretty dark for our family, you've shared in and eased our pain. Our family's benefit of your fellowship is a true testament and gift of God's love. Now, I've heard Pastor Mike from this same spot proclaim something to the effect of, 
If you cannot cry here and heal here, where can you? It reminds me of a psalm I came across, 56.8. Tears are prayers too. They travel to God when we cannot speak. In our society, we tell each other to be strong, don't cry. But in this church, it's okay to cry. I've learned tears are God's gift, not just to cleanse and heal, but as a reminder to stay gentle with each other and humble to the Lord. On a lighter note, in present life, I report to two really tough CEOs, co-CEOs. They're much younger than me, and well, they're, they're pretty demanding. Rocco, or Rocky, three on the left, and Lars, five on the right. And kidding aside, they are precious to me beyond words, and as such, I view motherhood not just as a duty-bound labor of love, but as my calling. This photo is of my older son praying with my younger son, who was having a hard time adjusting to preschool. But this photo is not unique. As I see and hear them pray together so often. With that said, I make daily choices to not only foster them spiritually, but to protect their spirituality. I am mindful about where we spend our time. And it's no coincidence that you see us here. Speaking of coincidences, in deepening and growing my faith, I know there are no coincidences, but God incidences. Good, bad, ugly, great, and small, and my awareness and gratitude of these God incidences has all had a large part in my growth. By God incidents, just when I thought I was done with the dating world, a lifelong friend introduced me to my now husband, Nico Bringelson. It was at the famous Manhattan Beach concerts in the park. I had no idea what an elevated faith journey I was stepping into by meeting this man. I learned he had a passion for praying out loud, but sadly, he was healing from a previous relationship where for seven years he was asked to refrain and only pray quietly. She was Christian and had a preference of praying silently in one's mind, and he respected that. I invited him to pray out loud with me. This was new for me too. I had grown up praying really only out loud for grace at the dinner table, bedtime prayers, or in guided congregational worship here, of course. But this notion to just speak to God spontaneously with someone you love or alone, just for anything or any time at all, out loud, this was new and exciting to me. So the first time we prayed out loud together, Nico had tears just streaming down his face. It shocked and worried me. I asked him if he was okay. I was worried that he was deeply sad. But no, to my surprise, he smiled huge, laughed, and enthusiastically said, of course I'm okay. I am feeling the spirit. He was overjoyed. Again, another wonderful psalm, 126.5. They that sow tears shall reap in joy. My mind was blown. How could I order this joy up for myself? Uh, God, I'll have what he's having. So I asked him if he might teach me how to deepen my faith like that. He said, of course, but that it was really very simple. His exact words were, like any relationship, we must spend time on it, our relationship with God. Fast forward to our marriage, right here in the sanctuary, where the theater the theater-loving people of this church aren't afraid to move mountains for a bride and groom who wanted to express love in a creative, faith-based way. <laughs> we did something non-traditional, where we had our nuclear families standing up with us in the service. This was to symbolize our families not simply joining together, 
but also joyfully embracing the notion of praying out loud together. We also celebrated the friendship both sets of our parents made with each other and the close friendship Nico and I each share with each parent. As such, in our wedding party, we had moms of honor and best dads. We knew then, and we know today, that our parents gave us the greatest intangible gifts parents could ever give their children, gifts of faith, hope, and love, and how to share and receive them. While we have this picture up, I've always loved how it appears as if the doves around the cross are joyfully flying out of my hand. We had just literally tied the Irish knot as a family and dropped the rope you maybe can see on the ground at our feet. But to, bo to focus back on those doves, one of the most wonderful gifts back to me from serving on the diaconate board is in learning about the beautiful, intentional details of this mid-century modern sanctuary designed by famous LA architect Culver Heaton. Just to start, the shape of the doves around the cross make an alpha and an omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The letters are used to designate the comprehensiveness of God, implying that God includes all that can be from the beginning to the end. Back to God incidences. They come in miracles, too. In my late 20s, I had the most challenging and enlightening experience of my life to that point. I was able to successfully donate a kidney to save and prolong my father's life. This took much focus and prayer and overall a lot of mental gymnastics for me to wrap my head around voluntar voluntarily having a vital organ leave my body. It wasn't easy, but it became easier knowing it was for Rick Farrell. He's always been my cheerleader. He's an exemplar model of an optimist and always just a cup half full kind of guy. He was very resistant to receive from me, but I was very persistent. And that's a whole other story. Back to the mental gymnastics, I grew pretty quiet to be able to concentrate on my goal of seeing this donation through. So I wasn't always present to support my parents emotionally through that time. But do you know who allowed me to be that way? You. So many of you in this congregation. You brought love, comfort, meals to our home for days. This is before the meal train website, by the way, was even a thing. It was astounding. Fast forward to my late 30s when my father found himself in an emergency need of heart surgery. He could hardly breathe. His doctor looked at him, my mother, and me with very sad eyes. I am so sorry, I cannot operate. My dad's single kidney that had always served him so well spontaneously acted up and was failing right in the middle of this emergency situation. The doc said surgery would almost certainly destroy the kidney. His exact words were, you all are stuck in a rock in a hard space. You are damned if you do and damned if you don't. My only advice to you is to go home as a family and pray. We knew what to do. I grabbed Nico. We gathered in our home, laid hands on each other, and soaked my dad in out loud prayer. In 24 hours, that kidney came back stable as ever, with no medical explanation. He was rushed into surgery, and you see how strong he is here today. I may not have believed that miracle if I didn't witness every step of it with my own eyes. Truly, I tell you, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Matthew 17, 20.
So here I am, raised in this church, and I want to get a, give a cheers to my parents for this gift. And having enjoyed and grown from countless choir and theatrical productions as a child and adult, both in the sanctuary and on our stage, the God incidence in this is that it's all been symbolic for me in evolving from my younger years in it being all about me or an ego drama into a much bigger picture, way beyond myself, in a Theo drama. A great story being directed by the Lord. And what makes life thrilling to me now and in the future is to discover my upcoming roles in that Theo drama. Amen. Thank you.